So Jesus goes to synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. And I, I just, I think we've read these stories so many times that we forget the real drama of this. He's been away. He's been proclaiming and preaching and collecting disciples. And he goes home. And as you know, many of us, it's tough to go home. And uh, I've said this before. My friend Bruce says every time he goes home to Virginia, they got a Bruce-sized box waiting for him. And it's the size that he was when he was 12. It's the 12-year-old Bruce size box. And uh, that's where they've kept him in their mind, right? Because when you've left home and they don't get to see you grow or become uh, a better person or a bigger person or whatever, they, they just don't know. So same with Jesus. He goes home to Nazareth. But they've heard about him, so they're really excited. And he goes up to read Scripture. And he ends up, you know, takes out the scroll and he reads Isaiah's proclamation of the year of Jubilee. And we read this uh, back in early December, we read the passage from Isaiah. Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and I have come to proclaim, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the Jubilee year in uh, Hebrew theology. The 50th year was the Jubilee year. And so Jesus is saying, I've come, he quotes from Isaiah, this proclamation of that year. And then Jesus says, in my presence, it's happening. This has come true now because I'm here. And actually, surprisingly, the people in the synagogue, the leaders, they think, well, that sounds pretty nice. You know, it's a good scripture. Isaiah's prophecy is coming true. That's great. Then they start to remember who this Jesus guy is. And they realize that he's... Somebody says, isn't he the son of that carpenter? And carpenter, they said tectone, which means anybody who works with their hands. It was a low class of the peasant class. The middle of the three peasant classes. He's, isn't he the son of a tectone? Right? And he, they say it with a sneer. Uh, the person who works with their hands. The person who has to labor for their money. And then they start to turn. And Jesus, they don't say anything bad except for that. But Jesus knows they're turning. And he says, he starts to get really riled up, Jesus. And he starts throwing stuff at them like, surely you're going to say, heal or heal thyself. And well, what about uh, the goodness for us? Jesus, you know he's getting worked up when he says this. i got to find it on my page. There were also, he says, surely you're thinking these blessings are for you. You'll say, but there were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, who was from Syria. Jesus reminds him of two episodes where God's people, chosen people, the Israelites, could have used some help, but God helped the outsider. So he says, here's the great one. There was lots of lepers in Israel when Elisha, the great prophet, he was a great healer, was around. He didn't heal any of your lepers, except for Naaman. And people are like, oh yeah, well he healed Naaman. Well, but he was from Syria. Oh. So Jesus reminds them, point blank, that the day of the Lord is not for them. The year of Jubilee is not for the people inside the synagogue, not for the religious leaders, not for people who can read, not for the scholarly, but for all the people on the outside. Release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's come in my presence. Sounds really good to us on a Sunday morning. We've read it often, and it brings us great joy until we realize that we are not the oppressed, and we are not the captives. We are, in fact, the empire. Just as a side note, in case you're worried about are we the empire or not, when we're wrestling with what's going on in the states and the change of the peaceful change of power, the peaceful and democratic change of power, as President Obama reminds us, the conversation always needs to turn to what part are we playing in the ascension of Donald Trump and his ideals, and to remember that we are part and parcel of how we've got to that. We're not maybe directly to blame. It's not Ron Fair's fault that Donald Trump is president. 
Let you off the hook there, Ron. Although he does spend a lot of time in Arizona. I'm just saying. I'll get to Arizona later. But when things like that happen, when we see a great shift come true, we have to remember that we are just as part of the American empire as Donald Trump and his kids. We are the powerful in our world. We are the wealthy. We don't like to say it. We don't like to admit to it because we always think we're kind of, you know, check, check or whatever. But compared to those that Jesus was talking about, we are totally the powerful and the wealthy. It's uncomfortable, but it's true. Well, they get so angry at him, and we might too. I, I just love this scene. It's one of the most dramatic scenes in all of the gospel lessons. They go to push him off a cliff. There's great artwork about this. If you want to look online, Jesus in Nazareth, there's often a picture of them like this with their hands out, and he's ready to go off a cliff. There, you know, there's a cliff handy to the synagogue, I guess. And uh, they're going to throw him off, and there's that famous line, but he passed from within their midst. Other times in scriptures it says, but he, uh, he, they could not lay their hands upon him. I always wondered as a kid, what was up with Jesus that he could just disappear like that? One writer in 1922 said, it's easy. His disciples were huge. <laughs> right? Right? Bruce Parton, one of the first historical Jesus writers in The Man That Nobody Knows, wrote, and as a 16-year-old, this really captured our imagination, they lived outside all their lives and they were fishermen and shepherds. Right? They were, you know, Hulk Hogan size. 22-inch, 24-inch biceps. And uh, no wonder the, the skinny little priests couldn't get their hands on them. Or skinny little priests. <laughs> they couldn't get their hands on them because he always had these guys around them that were big and had no problem laying their hands on some skinny little priests. Right? So they get them to the edge of the cliff. They're so angry. Because not only is he the carpenter's son, they realize that because when they realize he's the carpenter's son, it's this it's like the light goes on. They realize, wait a minute, a carpenter's son from the middle of the lower class would if he's talking about release of captivity and freedom, he's not talking about us. He's talking about his people. Jesus is talking about his people. And when that light comes on with, oh my goodness, he's a carpenter's son, that he's not talking about us. We, they, they get so angry. And then, just in case they didn't understand, he starts to say, no healing and release for you folks. I'm talking about those folks. And they want to throw him off a cliff. Oh, it's great drama. When we realize, like the priests in the synagogue, and the Levites, and the Sanhedrin, that this text is not about us, but about those people. What are we to do with it? What are we to do with this Jesus guy? When the freedom he talked about was our spiritual freedom, but the physical freedom, the materialistic freedom, the, the freedom from captivity and injustice and oppression is about other people. Well, I think what we need to wrestle with is what can our response truly be? I think what this scripture brings to us again in this new year is this obvious question about whether we want this to really happen or not. Do we really want the oppressed to be set free? Do we really want the lowly to be lifted up? And when it says the blind, just for the record, which is not, you know, particularly correct in this society where we love and find uh, hold our people who uh, live with blindness as equals, but in the old, old scriptures, in Jesus' time, of course, people who were blind or lame or had some illness, it was because there was some sin that had been passed down or something they had done wrong, right? It's awful to talk about today. But so when you read, I just want you, when you read the sights of the blind, that would be a real uproar in synagogue because in their minds the blind didn't deserve sight because something had, they'd done something wrong. Just like Job's friends when they said, well, you must have done something wrong, Job, or your parents did something wrong to pass this on to you, this suffering. So when Jesus says, release uh, freedom for the captives and the lowly will be lifted up and sight to the blind, meaning the sin will be lifted from those who are suffering. This was horrendous. Do we really want that 
to happen in our society. As a Christian church, we need to question whether we really, really want to be part of Jesus' action, this day of jubilee. We have to ask ourselves, uh, just let me tell you, it's easy for us to say, oh, we want equality for all. You know, how many of us say that? We all say that, you know. And uh, I, I love the, you know, the classic at the Miss America Awards, you know, they come up and say their little, what do you wish, what's your greatest wish for the world? I wish for peace for everybody, right? That's my Miss America tone. <laughs> and it looks better with the dress. Uh, and, and, and they did always some, some really flaky thing. The kind of stuff we blow birthday candles out and wish for. You know, peace for everyone, equality for everyone. I gotta, I gotta call us folks on this, because it's true even for me. Even for me. When I say equality for all, it's just easy to say that, because the all we actually think about are people that look like us. Jesus calls us to ask ourselves, what does equality for all really look like? And are, do we, would we really want this to happen? And so I think the way to break that open is to stop saying equality for all, but actually think about release for the captives, about giving the world over to those who've lived in captivity, those who are brokenhearted, those who are homeless, those who are oppressed, those who've lived in deep shame. So not, not believe that we're also going to be equal with them or they're going to, we're going to bring them up to us. How about just thinking about them taking over the world? What if Jesus' plan and Isaiah's plan and God's plan is to give the world to the captives, to the prisoners, to the oppressed, to the poor, to the hungry, to the homeless? Would we really want that to happen? Because that's what the day of Jubilee looks like. That's what Jesus came for. It takes a moment for us, we should spend some time looking at our charitable models. Always look at the way we live out charity, <clears throat> which is a word many people are uncomfortable with these days. Our, our charitable work, our service to the world, is it giving of our money, which is good, or is it a giving of our, our resources in a way that respects partnerships? One thing we can always say about the Minute, the minute for Mission in the United Church of Canada is they don't just send money and then tell people what to do with it. Well, we'll give you money if you do this. They work in partnership with the people of El Salvador. They work in partnership with the people of Kenya or South India or the people of Saskatoon or Toronto or St. John's, Newfoundland. They work in partnership to say, we have money, what, what can we do with it? And what do you think is best to do with it? That's a model that actually believes the oppressed should be given control. I'd like you to take a moment and picture in your mind the people that Jesus lists. And, and those are the people Jesus hung out with. I'd like you to picture in your mind for a moment the homeless and the oppressed, the prisoners. Don't forget the prisoners. Jesus was always about captivity. The prisoners. Think about those people in your mind. What comes into your heart? What images come into your brain? Would you really give the world over to them? Would you, would you be okay if Jesus came today and said, your time's done, God wants to give it to somebody else. God wants the world to be a world of freedom for those people. What if the world was given to the marginalized? What's your worry? What would we worry about if the person we walked past yesterday down by the Midtown Plaza, the people that were making mats for, what, what, if, what if they all of a sudden had the reins and we were put into retirement? Because uh, most of us are the 1%, if not, we're certainly the 2% that gets talked about. What if it's just given over to them? What would you worry about? I'm not going to ask you out loud. But this is what Jesus asks us to think about. Are we worried? Are we worried there's, there's just, there'd be just too violent or there'd be dishonesty or waste that they'd mess it up, that they don't really know? Like, what is, what is our worry about actually allowing God's world and God's kingdom to happen? 
Because Christianity isn't just being about nice, folks. About being about nice. About being nice. As that great story uh, I've told a number of times about uh, Tony Robinson, who was here in our in our congregation years ago. He had his first church in Cascadia in the mountains, and uh, that year he arrived. They had the most Christian person in town award, right? And they searched. They had a competition, and the award was given to Mr. Miller, the Jewish shopkeeper. Because he'd give his shirt off his back. And he was very charitable and very nice guy. Very good neighbor. So the most Christian of the year award in the town was given to the Jewish shopkeeper. Which just goes to show you we've lost our sense of what truly being a disciple of Christ is. If we think it's simply being nice to people. Here it is now. I'm back to Arizona, Ron. <clears throat> the state of Arizona, Reverend Deb told me yesterday, the day before is trying to pass a law where at uni in university courses they're not allowed to teach about white privilege. Even in their racial justice courses, the phrase white privilege would not be used if this bill passes. White privilege is the, you know, any time that we have something or get something or our life is made easier because the color of our white skin. That's white privilege. I live a lot of that every day. People listen to me in a way that they don't listen to people who don't look like me. And they, the state of Arizona wants to ban any mention of it in all of their colleges. That's empire. That's not what Jesus was talking about. That's what they thought was right in the synagogue. That's what we kind of have been living at Mayfair United Church. Just systemically, just subconsciously. But Jesus calls for the day of Jubilee a different day. When all those people that we have ignored or wish wouldn't have a voice would all of a sudden be given a voice. And they would be free. And they would be rejoiced in. They'd be loved. They'd have a voice to uh, participate. And they'd be in control. I wonder what that would look like. And I wonder if we really want to keep following Jesus. Jesus.